Hello! How's it going? Welcome back to class. Uh, today, as you can see on the schedule here, we're going to be talking about Assignment 4. Um, if, any, if there's any hitches with the stream today, I apologize. One of my monitors is kind of not working, so my my setup is a little different. So I'm going to be like looking, looking all over the place trying, trying to get this right today. Okay, so let's quickly go over uh, some course stuff. So assignment three is due tonight. I am acutely aware of that based on the amount of questions I've been getting today. Uh, one really important question that I've been getting uh, if I can just pull up Visual Studio here for a second, is a lot of people are saying, uh, this is assignment four, we'll go over this a bit later. Hey, uh, my assignment three is really, really slow. So what's happening there is uh, by default, when you launch a Visual Studio project, it's going to launch in debug mode. So over here, you can see in Visual Studio, um, that this project is in debug mode. I know that's probably a little bit small there on the screen. I can't increase this font size. But what's happening is uh, debug mode is used when you actually want to debug the program. And so Visual Studio will keep track in its debugger of all the different variables. Uh, it does timing stuff. And so there's a lot more going on. It also turns off all of the compiler optimizations. Um, so when you're in debug mode, your code is, go code is going to run very, very slowly. So what you want to do is switch it to release mode and that will turn off all the debugging symbols. Um, it will remove the memory tracking. It will optimize the code and it will run much, much faster. And that can be um, the difference between like hundreds of times of running speed, okay? So if your code is slow, just switch it from debug to release. Uh, someone out in the chat there is saying that their code runs fine even in debug mode. That's fine. Um, but I was just reading the chat here, but, uh, but yeah, make sure you switch to release if your code is slow in the debug mode and you'll be fine. Okay. Uh, one other thing is that this assignment is going to have sounds in it, but I'm having, let me see if I can get this working. I have, I've been having an issue with my desktop sounds recording on OBS. Okay. All right. So. Assignment four, let's, uh, let's go back here. So yeah, assignment three is due tonight and assignment four will re be released tomorrow morning. The reason I'm releasing it tomorrow morning and not tonight is because assignment four may contain a little bit of solution code for assignment three. So let me run the program. So let me see if I can get this desktop audio to work. It might be loud at first. Let's see here. All right, so that's a little bit loud. I'm gonna turn that down. Here's the assignment for solution code. You can hear that there's music playing in the background. And so that's one thing that's new for this is gonna be some music. And you'll notice when I start playing the game, it's going to switch from the menu music um, to the in-game music. There are also in-game sounds, so I'll just show that. So when I attack, there's a, there's a sword sound, if you can hear that. There's also, when I hit something, there's a sound. And when I kill something, there's a different sound. Uh, there's a sound when Link gets hit. There's a sound when Link dies. And a sound when Link picks up um, the heart. When I hit the escape key to go back to the menu, um, that music stops playing and the menu music starts playing again. Okay? Um, so those are the sounds. Now I'm going to turn off my desktop audio because I don't want to have to be yelling over that and it's going to get pretty obnoxious. But there are sounds. Um, someone is saying layout is messed up. I, I, I don't think the layout is messed up. Is anyone else seeing a, a weird layout uh, on the stream? Looks fine to me. Okay. Um, so I'm going to stop that, uh, that sound there just so we don't have to listen to it the whole time. So let me rerun that actually. Okay. So here is the assignment. It is 
Zelda, well, definitely not Zelda is what I've called it. And I'll quickly go over some of the features in the game um, before I go over the readme file. So just like when I introduce all of the uh, the games, I'm going to go over it first and then I'm going to go over um, the readme to make sure that everything is explained properly. So here we have a, a top-down view of a sort of clone of the original Legend of Zelda game. And so you can move up, down, left, and right. You cannot move on diagonals, so that's an important thing. Uh, there are enemies on the map now, so in Assignment 3 we didn't have any enemies. Those enemies have some different AIs this time. So there's two basic AIs in the game. So the enemies can either have patrol points, uh, and if I turn on uh, collision uh, box drawing here, or debug view, we can see that these enemies have patrol points. And so their AI actually goes back and forth between the patrol points that we've set. So this one down here is alternating between these two points, and this guy over here is alternating between these four points. There's a second uh, type of AI, and that type of AI is called the follow behavior. So this uh, entity over here, this knight, you can see that this knight, it's, it's drawing a line between the center of the knight and me, and the follow behavior is implemented as following, uh, as follows, sorry, no pun intended. Um, if there's no vision being blocked between the entity and Link, that um, entity will follow Link around the map. So you can see here that this knight is now following me, but as soon as I go behind these, and so uh, it's no the knight is no longer visible to me, the knight will return to his home point. Okay, so that's the follow behavior. The rule for the follow behavior is that um, if the enemy can see me and it has the follow behavior, then it will come after me. If it can't see me, then it will uh, it will go back to its home point. Now, there are this isn't the entire level, of course. There are more parts of this level. These up here also have the follow behavior, and as you can see, NPCs can actually pick up items in the game. All right. Now I'll go back down. I'll go over here. And I want to show one other important thing. So this NPC over here has a follow behavior. You might notice that some uh, entities or tiles in the game have blue outlines, some of them have white outlines, and some of them have black outlines. So let's go back over here. Let's just kill this knight so he's not following me around. Alright, so in this version of the assignment, um, entities have two different Boolean variables on them. One is whether or not they block vision, and one is whether or not they block movement. And so here, if it has a black outline, that means it blocks movement and it blocks vision. If it has a white outline, it means it blocks neither movement or vision. Okay, so this, this white outline here means I could walk through that enemy if I wanted to, and it doesn't block vision. Uh, if I go over here, there's a good illustration. Uh, if it has a red outline, then it blocks vision, but not movement. So this guy over here has a follow behavior. And so the follow behavior says that if it can see me, it's coming towards me. But if its vision is blocked, then it will go back to its home point. And so you can see here that we have sort of oscillating patrol behavior NPCs that block vision. And so since they block vision, when that line is crossing over one of the NPCs, then that, that other tektite has to move back to its home position. So this is one of these sort of interesting behaviors that you can get out of this. Um, so that's what the red outline means. There's one more type of outline, and that's sort of the opposite of red, and that is the blue outline. And so the blue outline blocks movement, but it doesn't block vision. And so here we have just a little tiny lake, and as you can see, you can see over the lake, but you can't move over the lake, right? So that's what this NPC is doing, it's just trying to move towards me, but it's blocked. Um, and what this allows us to do is some interesting game mechanics. So if I come down here really quick, you can see, um, well, if I turn off the debug menu, then how do I get into this dungeon? right? It's blocked by trees. But if I come down here, I can actually see the hidden entrance. And that's because if I turn on the debugging, this one here is red, meanings, meaning that it blocks vision, but it doesn't block movement. And so you can make these sort of secret entrances um, 
with this system. One other mechanic in this game is that um, you have these black tiles on the map, and the black tiles uh, mean that if you walk onto them, you teleport to another random black tile on the map. It could be the same one, but you're teleporting to a random black tile on the map, and there's currently three of them. So that's, that's what the black tiles do. Um, another mechanic is that there's now hit points and damage in the game. And so I'll go over the specifics of that uh, when I go over the text file. But essentially now you deal damage instead of immediately killing an entity. Also, entities will deal damage to you, right? So let me uh, escape out and come back in. So if an entity deals damage to me and I take damage, um, I can pick up a heart to fill my health back up to full. Also, something really interesting is the following. So if I go over here and damage this knight, and then I lure the knight up here, um, all entities can actually pick up the hearts. And so the heart, the heart will fill up entities as well. I thought that was just an interesting game mechanic. So, um, the hit points are displayed up here on this little hit point bar. And you can see down here that we're going to be able to assign starting hit points to entities as well. So this guy down here has eight hit points to start. This one has two, uh, Link has three, and all of that will be defined in the level file. But uh, this drawing of the hit point bar is going to be done for you in, um, in the assignment. That code is already written, so you don't need to worry about drawing that. There's already enough stuff to actually implement um, in this assignment. Okay, so let's exit out of that real quick, and we'll open up the assignment readme file. And we'll go through that and talk about all the different stuff that you have to do specifically. So, uh, as usual, I don't need to read this anymore, I hope. But for this assignment, you will, have to, uh, you will zip and submit the entire source folder of the assignment. So don't put in any extra files unless you're doing bonus material, etc, etc. Alright. Let's get into the, into the good stuff. The actual program specification. So in this assignment, you will be writing the game that was presented in class. So that's the assignment four, which is definitely not Zelda. Um, the game must have the following features. Okay, assets. So entities in the game will be rendered using various textures and animations, which we'll be calling assets. Assets are loaded once at the beginning of the program and stored in the asset class, which is stored by the game engine class. All assets are defined in assets.txt with the syntax defined below. So the assets haven't really changed um, since the since assignment three. However, we have added sounds, okay? And I know that some of you have already added sounds to your games, and so that won't be super new. But essentially, the only thing um, that's different about the assets file is that we now have sounds. So if I come over here to assets, this will look pretty identical to assignment three. Uh, except there's just more stuff because Zelda has lots of different tiles in it. Um, and also, I've loaded the following sounds for you. Okay, so we've got some music files. This is the title, um, music title and the music level. And then we've got some different sounds that we'll play. So when you want to go to play a sound in your game, what you can do is you can play the sound based on this string right here. Okay, so that's, that's pretty easy. Uh, all right, so let's get into the actual stuff that you have to do for the assignment. So the first thing is uh, the player. So the player entity in the game is... Re oh, let me highlight this so when I'm reading it, you can sort of follow along. So the player entity in the game is represented by not link, which has several different animations. Run up, or sorry, run down, run up, run right, stand down, stand up, stand right, Attack up, attack down, attack right. You must determine which direction and state the player is currently in and assign the correct animation. Um, so let me, let me read this first and then I'll go back to an example. So the player is assigned the following animations in the direction facing. Please note that left will be accomplishing by, accomplished by mirroring the right. So there is, there's only a right animation, there's no left animation. We can just mirror that using the X scale. So there's stand dir, so when no input or both uh, opposite is being given to the playing. Run dir, when, the move is, when, the, when move input is given to the player in a given direction. And attack dir is when the player's sword is currently visible from an attack. And I'll explain that, what that means in a second, just let me launch the uh, game again. Okay, 
So here we're launching the solution file. And essentially what that means is that Link is going to be assigned a different animation based on two different things. One is the current state um, of the game that Link is in, and the other is the direction that Link is facing. Okay, so what does that mean? Well, for example, there's a stand direction. So stand left, that's when I'm not moving, but I'm facing left. There's stand right, that's when I'm not not moving, but facing right. And we can see that the stand right, or sorry, stand left is just a mirrored copy of stand right. There's stand up and there's stand down. But you can see here that stand up and stand down, you can't just mirror them because in one you're looking at Link's back and in the other you're looking at Link's front. And so that up and down are not mirrored, but left and right are mirrored. Uh, similarly, there are running animations for each of the directions as well. So when I'm running, Link's legs are moving. When I'm moving up and when I'm moving down, the legs are moving, okay? Uh, also, there's attacking animations. So when Link has the sword and is attacking, you can see that the legs sort of spread out um, for a little bit. So what you're going to have to do is when Link attacks, you have to play that animation for a little bit and then go back to the standing animation. You can also see here that while I'm moving, um, the stand, the attacking animation is playing as well. Something that's important, um, which I will talk about, is that if you attack and then change direction, the sword follows with you. You see how that happens? It's very, um, it's very quick, but the sword will follow with you when you change directions. See how that happens? So you can attack something there and attack something there. Um, you can sort of turn while you're attacking. Okay, so that's the facing animation and how you have to implement that. The player moves with the following controls. So left is A, so it's standard WASD um, movement, except for uh, attack is the spacebar. The player can move up, left, down, and right at any time during the game, but the player can only move horizontally or vertically at a given time. So that means right now, if I'm holding left, I'm moving left. If I hold up, I move up. But if I hold up and left, then I'm only moving in one of those directions, okay? Um, and whichever you choose is fine, whether or not you want to stick with, like, for example, the, the first key that was pressed, or you always choose the horizontal movement is fine, as long as you're only moving either horizontally or vertically at any given time. Um... So if, if opposite directions are held, the player will be giving a standing animation. So that means, for example, here I'm holding left and then I hold right and then I'm standing, right? I'm not running in one direction. If I hold up and I hold down, then Link is given the standing animation, which I'm doing right now. The player can only attack once. Um, oh, sorry. The player can only attack once its current attack animation has finished. So what that means, oh, I'm dying. One second. Uh, I can't just attack as fast as I can press the spacebar. If you can hear my spacebar, right? Uh, I have to wait for the current attack animation to end. So you can only attack um, every 10 frames um, currently based on the assignment. So you have to wait for that attack animation to end before you're allowed to attack again. The player collides with tile entities in the level whose bounding box blocks movement and cannot um, see cannot move through them. So what that means is that here we have these black tiles. Um, black tiles block vision and movement. And so if Link's bounding box collides with one of these tiles that blocks movement, you cannot walk through it. Okay. Um, however, down here, as we see, some of these block movement, but some of them don't. And so if the tile doesn't block movement, it won't block the movement. If it does block the movement, then it will block the movement. Okay. Oh, someone's chasing me. Oh, no. Okay. Oh, they're chasing me from all over the level. Okay. The player will be given a C bounding box of a specific size in the level file. So as you can see again, just like in uh, the Mario game, uh, Link's animation and Link's bounding box are not necessarily the same size. Okay. So you have to read that in. Um, the player will be given a C health component with a maximum health that is specified in the level file. So in the level file here, 
Um, there's going to be Link's maximum health defined, and the maximum health is also your starting health. So here, Link has uh, three maximum health, but he currently has one health, right? So you have a maximum health and a current health, and when you pick up a heart, your health gets refilled to the maximum health. So it would go up to three here. But if you're already at three, then it will just stay at three. When the player's um, current health is less than or equal to zero, the player respawns and the link die sound should play. So what that means is that if I currently take enough damage to die, I will appear back at the center and the link die sound will play. Um, also, if I go back to here uh, with the knight, um, you're going to see that enemies can do different amounts of damage. So when the knight hits me, I'll actually take two damage. So let me kill him again so I can continue to demonstrate things. All right. Um, so there's a new component in this assignment, and that is the C invincibility component. Um, so what this means is if the player has a C invincibility component currently attached to it, then it takes no damage from enemies and its sprite is made transparent um, for the duration. So the duration of the component is reduced each frame and when the duration reaches zero, the component is removed, making it vulnerable to attacks again. So what this is doing is it's simulating um, one feature of a lot of different games, which is called um, invincibility frames. Okay, so I'll explain what that is in a second if I can get back to the game here. Where did the game go? Okay, so if we look over here, um, so the way we're going to detect damage in the game is when Link's bounding box is intersecting with the bounding box of an enemy. So every frame we're going to check for that. But what happens if we were actually standing like on an enemy? Then what would happen is when we stand on an enemy for a split second, every frame of the game damage is going to be detected and we're basically going to instantly take damage 60 times a second, okay? And we don't want that to happen. So in order for that to not happen, most games have what's called invincibility frames. And so there's a certain amount of time after you get hit that you can't get hit again. So if you watch me get hit here, what will happen is Link's sprite will turn transparent, okay? And then after half a second or so, I'll no longer be transparent. And what that'll do is that for the duration of that transparency, I'm not taking any more damage, as you can see. But as soon as I become non-transparent again, I will take damage. So those are called invincibility frames. And we're implementing that through a component that has a certain duration. So the invincibility component, we'll go look at that in a bit, but it'll have an, uh, a duration as well. When the player collides with an enemy while not invincible, the following things happen. So um, the player's health is reduced by the enemy's damage component, the link hit sound should play, and the player is given an invincibility component which lasts for 30 frames. So 30 frames at 60 frames a second is half a second. So that's how all of that works. All right, other entities. What's going to happen to other entities? So each tile and NPC in the game specifies two Boolean values of whether it blocks movement and whether it blocks vision. If a tile blocks movement, the player collides with it and NPCs, other NPCs collide with it and cannot pass through. If an entity blocks vision, then it does not affect enemy line of sight. And we'll see the specification for that below. Um, so this stuff is stored in the C bounding box component. So bounding box now, instead of just having a size, also has these two uh, booleans in it. And we'll take a look at that in the code later. Actually, let's just take a look at it now. So in components, um, in our, uh, so here's the invincibility component, all right? So the invincibility component has this iframes variable. So the iframes variable is how many frames you're going to be invincible for. So for example, if I pass 30 in the into the constructor of the invincibility component, then what's going to happen is that every frame in your status um, we're going to have a new system called the status system. You're going to subtract one from the current remaining iframes. And then if links iframes are at zero, then you remove the component. So it's a really easy system to work with. Um, also, health component is, is new. 
So you're going to have a maximum amount of health and a current amount of health. So the, um, the constructor for this just takes in a maximum and a current, and you'll read those from the file and pass them into the constructor of the component. Also, we have the damage component. So the damage component, again, through the constructor, you give it damage. And what the damage component does is this component is attached to an entity, and when that entity collides with another entity that it's supposed to deal damage to, like for example, we're going to have a sword entity that should deal damage to enemies. We're also going to have enemies that should deal damage to the player. And so what's going to happen is that when those two entities collide, the damage component of the damaging entity, will um, that damage amount will be subtracted from the current health of the entity that got damaged. So that's how we're going to be implementing that. Uh, we have lifespan again, and we also should have the bounding box component. Yes, so we have bounding box down here. So bounding box has two new uh, booleans in here. One is block move and one is block vision. And so bounding box now has two separate constructors. One is for just the size. Um, and if you use this, then block move and block vision by default will be given values of false. Or you can construct it with the size. Um, and the booleans as well. And that's probably what you're going to be using most often. Okie doke. So, uh, oops, I've also, I've also got the gravity component here. And so gravity is not in this game, so I'll remove that. And we have two new, be two new components here, which I'll get to in a second. So that I just wanted to go over some of those. Okay. Also, when the player steps onto a tile with the black animation, they are teleported to a random black tile on the map. And I showed that before, but let me just show that again. So when the player steps onto one of these black tiles, um, oops, it's going to be teleported to another random black tile. And so why I call it the black tile is because in the assets file, that one is just, the animation is just called black because it's a, it's a purely black tile. So that's what that does. And so if I just hold up, I'm going to be teleporting around the map. Okay. And now we have to talk about the attacking in the game. Oh, one second, just reading the chat. Okay. So when the player attacks, a sword appears for 10 frames and then disappears, approximately one tile away from the player in the direction that they are facing. The sword's... Uh, the player's sword should be given a bounding box equal to the animation size. Okay, so let's go over that part first. So wherever the player is facing, if I turn on the debug here, when I press the attack key, a sword is going to appear one tile or 64 pixels to the right of the player because he's facing to the right. If I'm facing down, then the sword is going to appear down. If I'm facing left, it's going to appear left. And if I face up, it's going to face up. And you can see that the sword's bounding box is the entire size of that animation. So down here, for example, if I attack the enemy, you're going to check in your collisions whether or not the sword's bounding box is overlapping with the entity's bounding box. Okay. When the sword collides with an enemy, it deals uh, its damage component worth of damage to the health of the enemy that it collides with. The sword should only do damage for one frame, and then its damage component should be removed, so that it does not deal damage for every frame that it overlaps. Okay, so what that means is the following. Remember how we talked about how we needed invincibility frames um, in order to avoid taking damage every frame? Well, the sword appears for 10 frames on the screen, right? So let's say the sword deals one damage when it attacks. So if the sword dealt one damage for its attack, and it overlapped for, with an entity for 10 frames, then it would actually deal 10 damage over those 10 frames. But we don't want that to happen. And so how we're going to prevent that from happening is as soon as you have um, shown, or as soon as you've detected that the sword has collided with an entity, then what you do is you remove the damage component from the sword. And by doing that, it'll no longer have any damage, and so it won't be subtracting health from the enemy. So that's just one way that we implement that. There are other ways that you could do that, but I think that one is probably the easiest. 
So when the sword is swung, the slash sound should play. When the sword collides with an enemy, the enemy hit sound should play. When an enemy's health is reduced to zero, it's destroyed. And when an enemy is destroyed, the enemy die sound should play. So all that is pretty self-explanatory. Alrighty, so into some of the new fun stuff. <laughs> My cat is meowing to get out. Um, so NPC entities. NPC entities will be given an AI behavior in the level file, either follow or patrol. Okay, so in the level file, you'll actually see this. My cat is actually <laughs> meowing really loudly. Let me just uh, let him outdoors. It'll take me like 20 seconds. One sec. Sorry about that. Okay, so in the level file, what we're going to have is we're going to have AI, or sorry, NPC entities that are given either a follow string or a patrol string for their AI behavior. Follow means that it will follow the player when the player is in direct line of sight or head back to its original position when not in line of sight. When an enemy at its, is at its home position, it should not oscillate. So what does that mean? Well, uh, let me go back to where we have that particular behavior. So this is the follow behavior. Um, some entities currently have the follow behavior. So this uh, knight here, for example, has it. And what I've done for you in the rendering function is that in order to debug things, I've drawn a line from the center of any entity with the follow behavior to the center of the player. And so let me go over here to show another example of this. So this entity over here currently has the follow behavior as well. Um, but its vision is not being blocked by these tiles because they don't block vision. So if I go up here, these entities also have the follow behavior, but their vision is being blocked, right? So if I move up so that this line is currently not colliding with any of these tiles that block vision, this entity will start moving toward me. And if I move back down, it will go back to its home. So you see that? Oh my god. <laughs> so that, that's, that can happen too. Um, so what it means, what that oscillating behavior meant is that when you, when you go back to your home position, you shouldn't be checking if you're exactly at the home position. Because if you're checking if you're exactly at the home position, what can happen is that like if you have the home position right here, um, your speed is never going to be such that you'll land exactly on the home position, right? You're always going to go a little bit past it. And so if you go a little bit past it and then you go back a little bit past it and then back a little bit past it, that'll be this like oscillating behavior. So what you should do is you should check to see if you're at the home position by checking to see if the distance from the home position is within some small amount, maybe five or six or eight pixels or something like that. So that's how you would do that. So that's the follow behavior. Um, now we have another behavior. And I'll show the syntax for these behaviors uh, once we've explained both of them. So uh, NPCs can also be given the patrol behavior. And patrol means that it will move towards a series of patrol positions, looping back around to the start when the final one is reached. An NPC has reached its patrol position if it is within a distance of five from it. Okay, so I've given you, um, I've given you what I meant by that. And now let's go back into the game. If I can just launch that again. And we'll see, see what that means. Okay, so... Let me find a patrol behavior. So here's a patrol behavior. So in the level file, we've specified two points in the level that this little guy down here is going to move towards. So the behavior essentially is that you move toward the next patrol point and when you get within five pixels of it or some other small amount, you'll consider yourself as having reached that checkpoint in the patrol and then you'll head to the next one. And so over here, there are four of them, 
right? Defined in this order. So the order that you define them matters. Um, so here he's moving up to the right, down to the left. So that's the patrol behavior. Um, and actually, let me get to the to the, the syntax part of the of the level file in order to explain that, because I'll do all that at once. But basically, we will define four points in the level file um, for this behavior to be followed, for this patrol behavior. If we see over here, there are three entities, all with different speeds, and they will be walking um, toward their patrol points. And we have the home behavior or the follow behavior um, uh, on this entity over here. Okay. Tiles. This is basically the same thing as assignment three, but I'll read it anyway. So tiles are entities that define the level geometry and, uh, and interact with the player. Tiles can be given any animation that's defined in the asset file. Tiles will be given a bounding box equal to the size of the animation. The current animation displayed for a tile can be retrieved with, the, with this function. And if a tile is given a heart animation, any NPC that collides with it should have all of its hearts or its health filled to the maximum, and then the heart tile is destroyed. Okay, so that's how we detect um, heart pickups, is that if the tile that something collides with has the heart animation, then any NPC or the player that collides with it should have its health refilled, and then the heart is just destroyed. Okay. Um, drawing. The game window is given a fixed size of 1280 by 768 pixels. So this is not a 16 by 9 aspect ratio. And the reason for that is because I wanted it to be a specific amount of tiles wide. So it's 20 tiles by 12 tiles. Rendering of entities is provided for you, as well as a debug rendering mode, which can be toggled. Um, oh, this is the C key, and this is the T key. Okay, so the debug mode can be toggled with C, and T can toggle the drawing of textures. So if I go back here, for example, if I press T to turn off the textures, and I hit C to toggle the debug view, then all you're looking at is the debug view. And this can be very useful when you're actually trying to debug your program, just to get rid of those textures to be able to debug the logic. So the T key and the C key do that. Um, there's also pausing functionality. So if I pause, the game pauses, and then I unpause right? Pause, unpause. That should work with the sword as well. So I've just paused it during an attack animation. And it also works during invincibility frames. Okay, so the pausing should take all of that into account. All right. Um, you are required to change the camera position of the game window to alternate between two modes based on the M follow variable in the um, in the scene Zelda file, which we'll go over, we'll go over the code last, but I'll show you that. So if that, if that variable is true, then you're in follow mode. If it's false, you're in room mode. So by default, it's false. Um, so in follow mode, the camera is always centered on not link. In room mode, the camera is centered in the middle of the room. So what does that mean? So here if I go back, so this is room mode, okay? So in the level file, we have uh, rooms and we have tiles. And I'll explain that in a bit, but this is essentially one room. Within that room, we have tiles. Um, so, so we're displaying a room now. When we leave the room, we have to calculate basically every frame which room that link is in. When we move to another room, we change the camera so that it's facing that room, okay? But if we hit the Y key, then it's going to toggle it into follow mode so that now the game looks like this, so that the camera is always centered on not link. And doesn't this look weird? Like, it's the same game, but it's a completely different feel just by changing the camera looks and feels completely different. And so we'll go back to room view and oh, you know, thankfully now it's back to the look and feel of Zelda. So this is what you have to do is change the view and we talked about views um, in a previous lecture. So that's one other feature that you have to do. Okay, now I just talked about rooms but I have the spec here. So each level 
is split up into individual rooms given an x and y coordinate. Room xy is defined by the rectangle x times w, y times h, wh, where w and h are the width and height respectively. So when Notlink moves to a new room, the camera should center to that room. So what does that mean? It means that, uh, so the width and the height are defined up here. Um, and those are given in tiles, okay? So all of our levels will have the same format. So please, when you make your own level for this game, don't, um, don't change the width and the height of the tiles. So it's 20 across and it's 12 high. So what does that mean? So let's go back to the game here. So um, our levels are 20 wide and 12 high in terms of tiles. So essentially what you have to do is you have to figure out, based on Link's world coordinate, which room that Link is in, based on that formula, okay? So the room, let's say uh, by default we're at room 00, zero okay? So Link um, is in room 00, zero. And actually what I should do here is bring up the, um, the blackboard. So let's bring up the blackboard. Uh, how do I bring up the blackboard again? Okay. Give me one second. Okay. Oh no, blackboard exposed. Oh, my blackboard scene isn't working. That's fine. We'll just do it like this. Okay. So the game, let's say that this is the entire game world right here. Let me make that white. Okay. So let's say this is the entire game world. Um, it could be infinitely big. It doesn't matter. We've split the game world into rooms. So if I can draw that um, with these, uh, how will I do that? Let's say, let's say for example, uh, what's the best way to do this? Maybe lines. I'm trying to make these sort of equal sized, but it's a little bit difficult. Yeah, <laughs> spray brush. Okay, so we've divided our world into these rooms. I'm gonna put, uh, rooms are gonna have coordinates. So this is room zero, zero, okay? This one would be room zero, uh, negative one, right? This room, is, this is zero, one. This is uh, one, zero. This is negative one, zero. So Y increases downwards and it decreases upwards. So here, this one is room zero, negative one. And within each room, you have tiles, okay? So within each room, you have tiles and each of those has a tile coordinate. So within the, the, these rooms, this would be tile zero, one, or sorry, zero, zero, right? Zero, zero. This would be tile one, zero. This would be tile zero, one. This would be tile um, two, one, etc. So there's two coordinate systems. There's a room X and Y, and there's a tile X and Y. And tiles are 64 pixels wide in this game. Okay, so that's what the coordinate system is. So for example, in the level file, if I say that uh, a given entity is in room 01 with tile coordinate 4, 3, this is how you lay it out. And so um, our window is, is going to be 1280 by 768 pixels. So 1280 is 20 times 64. And so if Link's position, for example, is something like 1500, um, 600, which would be around here somewhere, we're going to have to somehow calculate that Link should be in room one zero from that, okay? And coordinate zero zero in the game world is at the top left coordinate of room zero zero. So room zero zero, it's top left coordinate up here, 
that is position zero zero in the game world. The bottom right hand coordinate of this room, uh, if I move this a little bit, this coordinate down here, that is 1280,760. So if I walk around now, if I'm like right here, right next to this edge, since it's 1280 long, then link is at approximately x coordinate 1200 here. If I go past 1280, let's say to 1300, now I'm in the next room, right? And that's how you would define that. So you could divide this by the width or whatever. I'm leaving that up to you. But that is the room and tile coordinate system explained. Okay, let's go back. So that's the rooms. Um, so the P key should pause the game, the C key toggles the wireframe and debugging, and the T key toggles the texture rendering. The Y key should toggle between the follow or the room camera. The escape key should go back to the main menu or quit if you're on the main menu. Okay. Config files. There's two configuration files in the assignment, the assets config file and the level configuration file. Um, I have already gone over this in a previous lecture, so this is the same as assignment three. Um, and if we look at the assets file, the only thing that's different is that now there are sounds as well. Okay. And I actually forgot to edit this, so I need to put in the, um, the sound config, but we don't need to go over assets file because we've already done that. But the level file, um, I do need to go over. So let's do this. So the player specification is as follows. The player is going to have several variables right here. So in the level file, and I'll show the example of the level file after I explain this, it's going to have X, Y, B, X, B, Y, S, and H. So spawn position is X and Y. And what that is, that is the spawn position of the player in room 00. zero. So the player is going to spawn in room 00, zero in your game. But within room 00, zero, it's going to spawn at, at this location. It's going to be given a bounding box size of BX, BY. Um, it's going to have a speed of S. And so speeds are really easy for the player in this game because since you can only move up, down, left, or right, then the speed is just how much you travel in that direction. And it's also going to be given a maximum health. So if we come over here to the level file, where is that? The level file down here. Here is the level file. So the player is going to be specified. Oh, I apologize. I was incorrect when I explained where the player spawns. The X and Y position where the player spawns is given in game world coordinates. So not rooms, not tiles. It's given in game world coordinates. So you can see here that the player is going to spawn at 640, 360. It's going to be given at a bound, it's going to be given a bounding box of size 48 by 48, which is centered on the player's position. It is going to be given a movement speed of five, and it's going to be given a maximum health of three. So if I come in here and I say edit the maximum health to be seven, and I edit the speed to be 15, then when I rerun the game, if I can do that real quick, When I run the solution again, then this should be reflected. So Link is now super fast, right? Running around the map and I haven't loaded the health properly, but do what I say, not what I do. Okay. So the solution, I'm going to have to fix that when I release it, but you know what I mean? Should have been seven health there. Okay. So that is how the player is specified. Now there's also the, oh, let me go back and edit the, uh, the player speed back to five and three. Okay. The tile specification. So the tile specification has a number of variables. Uh, so we have tile name, RX, RY, TX, TY, BM, BV. So what does that mean? Well, the room coordinate is two integers specified by RX and RY. The tile coordinate is TX, TY, whether or not it blocks movement, it's going to be a one if it's true or a zero if it's false. If it blocks vision, it's going to be one if it's true and zero if it's false. So let's go back over here now and look at the level file. So the level file, there's a number of different assets. The way I've, I've laid out the assets, you can go look at this if you want to. 
but rock BL is the bottom left rock, okay? So what do I mean by that bottom left rock? Well, if I go back to the game, um, which is over here, okay. So bottom left rock is at position X. So it's at room zero, zero. So that's the starting room. It's at tile position X 13. So that's this one right here. And Y position zero, which is this one right here. So we're currently looking at this tile. So that has the BL rock BL animation because it's actually the bottom left with this nice little bevel. The other ones are rock BM. So BM means the middle block. And this one is at 14 zero. This is at 15 zero, 16 zero, 17 zero, all in room zero zero. So if you look here, we see all these tiles. This is, these are the tiles that have been specified for room zero zero. Okay. I haven't put the enemies in yet, but we'll talk about that afterwards. And so for example, um, all of these tiles, the rock tiles, are going to block both vision or movement and vision. So that's what these ones are for. So the first one is block movement and the second one is block vision. If I go down here, the only exception is the black tile because I want to be able to walk on top of the black tile. So the black tile doesn't block movement and it doesn't block vision. Also, the heart tile doesn't block movement or vision either because I want to be able to walk on top of that. Then what I do is I specify all the tiles for room 01. So room 01 is the room that's below the starting room. So currently I'm at 00. If I go down one room, then now I'm in this room. So all of this, if you look at it, is the, speci the specification of where all these bushes should be. Right? So these are all the bush animation. And you can see some of these here, too, like all of them block movement and vision. However, these two here have, they don't block movement. So if we go back, oh, I'm being ambushed, right? So there's two bushes there in the level file that don't block movement. And that's why they're outlined in red here. And they allow me this sort of secret entrance or secret exit to this part of the level. So that's how I do that create these sort of fake walls. It's a really easy way to do that. Um, okay, so that's how tiles are specified. That's pretty easy. Next, we have probably the hardest thing. Uh, one of the harder things in the assignment is the NPCs. So the NPC uh, specification is a little bit complex, but don't worry, it's, it's not that bad. Okay, so how am I gonna start this? Uh, so the NPCs are given the following variables. So first it's going to have the string NPC, then is going to be the name of the NPC, and then we're, oh, that's the animation name. Then we're gonna have RX, RY, TX, TY, BM, BV, H, D, and then a bunch of variables relating to the AI. So let's go over the non-AI variables first. So. Here we have, uh, the first one is the animation name. So that's gonna be just a string of which animation is going to be given to this NPC. So for example, if it's tektite, then it's going to be given the tektite animation and that's, gonna, that's how it's gonna be drawn to the screen. If uh, the, the RX and the RY, similar to the tiles, so all of these are the exact same as the tile specification. It's gonna be the room coordinate that it starts at and the tile position within the room. It's also going to be given the block movement and block vision um, variables. Then we have uh, maximum health. So this is uh, H and we have damage, which is D. And then we have the AI behavior stuff. I'll come back to the AI behavior stuff. But what I want to do first is, oh, this is the assets file. Let me go back to the level file. So let me find the knight, okay? So the knight is going to be at room position, uh, room zero, zero. It's going to start at the tile 16, six within the starting room. It's not going to block vision or movement. It's has five maximum health and it deals two damage. Okay. So, so that's the specification of the night. And we'll talk about the AI parameters in a second. The tech tight is uh, the one in the bottom left, for example, is going to be given eight health 
and it's going to deal one damage. So if I change this damage to 10, then whenever the player collides with that entity, he's going to take 10 damage. All right. Now we have the AI behaviors. So this AI string is going to be a single string and it's either going to be follow or patrol. So if that string is follow, then what's going to happen is the next variable is going to be a single floating point number, which is how fast it's going to chase you. Okay. So if I go back to the file here, the level one file, the knight has the follow behavior and it's going to follow me at speed one. If I go down to the specification of the tech tights at the top of the level, then what I see is those are going to follow me with a speed of three. So they're three times as fast as the, as the knight. If I go back to the game and I show this behavior, so the knight is following me at speed one. It's quite slow, right? But if I go up here, these are following me three times as fast as the knight. Okay. Oh, and I died, so that's fine. Let me kill this guy. Ah, all right. So that's the follow, that's really easy. But if that AI behavior, if that string right here after the damage is equal to patrol, then you're going to have a bunch of things come after it. The first thing that comes after it is the patrol speed. So how fast it moves to its different patrol positions. Then you're going to get N, which is an integer, and that's the number of patrol positions that are to follow. Then you're going to get xi and yi for each of those tile positions of the patrol of that NPC. So for example, let's say I said NPC tech tight 0050. What does that mean? Well, that means we're going to spawn an NPC with the animation name tech tight in room 00 with tile position 150. Um, here, that tech tight will not block vision or movement. Um, so this, and oh, sorry. Um, this should be up here. This NPC has a maximum health of two, actually, because two is here, and a damage of one. So that's what those variables are, right? So this is the room. This is the tile within the room. This is block movement, block vision. This is health, this is damage. Then we see patrol. So because it's patrol, the next variable is going to be the speed of the patrol followed by four positions. So there's four positions. That means there's eight integers. And those eight integers, this is the first position in the patrol, 1510. This is the second position in the troll, in the, in the troll, patrol, 157. This is the third position and this is the fourth position. So the way you'll read this in is that you'll read in patrol, then you'll read in one more variable, then you'll read in n, and then you'll have to read in two times n more variables where it goes x1, y1, x2, y2, x3, y3, x4, y4, okay? So it's a little bit more complicated, but not that bad. So let's go over the functions in the actual code itself. And after we've gone over the code, I'll come back and I'll, I'll give you my recommended um, way of doing this assignment. So first of all, uh, all of your code that you're gonna be editing is going to be in the scene Zelda class with one exception is the physics class, okay? So if we go to the physics class, in assignment three, we had these functions. The functions were get overlap and get previous overlap. So if you want to, you are completely allowed to just copy and paste your code from assignment three into assignment four for both of these functions. And those functions should work perfectly for this assignment. The other functions are, first we have is inside, and what you can see here from the variables that are, that are input, we're going to input a vec2 position, and we're also going to input an entity. So what is inside is going to do is it's going to calculate whether or not the input position is inside the bounding box of the given entity, okay? And why we would want to do that, um, I'll leave that up to you, but it's going to be a, a helpful function for you. 
The next function is going to be, uh, let's, let's look over entity intersect first. So entity intersect is going to take in A, B, and E. So, oh, sorry, no, no, no. Let's first go over line intersect. So the line intersect function was given to you in a previous lecture where we did the, the, um, the ray casting and the line segment intersections. So if you go back to that lecture, in the lecture slides, I had line, uh, I had vectors for the positions. So line segment AB and line segment CD. So that's what this is, is those exact coordinates. And this function is going to return whether or not there was a line segment intersection between line segment AB and line segment CD. However, as you saw in the slides, we're not returning just a Boolean, we're returning two values. So I just have this struct up here to contain those values. So what this function does is it computes whether or not there was an intersection and also if there was an intersection, the position of that intersection. Okay, so the position on the map where the intersection occurred. Then there's an entity intersect function and what this does is it takes line segment AB and it's going to return whether or not that line segment collides with an entity. And so what you have to do, if I go back um, to here and I erase some of this stuff. So entity intersect is the following. I'm going to have an entity here. This is the bounding box of the entity and we're going to have a line segment. And so what you're going to have to do in entity intersect is determine whether or not the input line segment intersects with the bounding box of the entity. And the way you can do that really easily is just by calculating all of these four line segments, okay, and doing the, the line segment intersection. So for example, um, if this, if we call like this, uh, like, Oh my God. Uh, this is like position one, this is position two, this is position three, and this is position four, and this is A, and this is B, okay? So you'd calculate position one, position two, position three, and position four, and then you already have a function, you have this line intersect function, which says whether or not two line segments intersect, so what you do is you calculate the line segments of the bounding box, and then you just call that function four times, right? So you say, okay, does line segment AB intersect with line segment 1, 2? Does line segment AB intersect with 1, 3? Does it intersect with 3, 4? Does it intersect with 2, 4? And if either of those intersect, then the result of this function is true. And what you're going to use for this is you're going to use this for whether or not um, a, you have vision between an entity and another entity. So for example, here we have the line segment drawn between the center of the player and the center of this knight NPC. And what you see here is that we're calculating vision by doing the line intersection of this line between the NPC and the player with all four of these lines around this tile. Okay, so that's that's what those functions are used for. And what you have to do is just implement those functions. So those five functions are there for you to implement. These two functions you should have done in assignment three and you are allowed to just copy and paste those over. The reason I didn't give you mine is because some students are inevitably going to um, submit assignment three late. So I didn't want you to, to give you assignment three solution code in assignment four. Okay, so everything else um, is going to be done for you except the scene Zelda class. So let's just go over the functions in the scene Zelda class. So the constructor here, uh, let's go over actually this one. So what variables do we have here? Well, we're going to have the player and we have player config. Um, so these are similar to what you saw in assignment three. Um, someone asked if it's completely inside return false. I didn't even think of that. N yes. If it's completely inside return false, but that's not a use case for our game necessarily. Uh, okay, so we're going to have the player, 
We're going to have the level path. This is the, the path that we read the level file from. We have the player config variable, and we just have three more variables, which is whether we're drawing the textures, we're drawing the collisions, or and whether or not we're implementing the follow camera or not. So by default, mfollow is false, and so that means we're going to be using the room view by default. So let's look through the functions. The constructor is the same as assignment three, so is init. So for example, um, I've registered some functions for you. So if we run the default, or if we run the student code, I've done the menu for you, and the music is playing on the menu. But when you start playing the game, this is all you see. Okay, all I've done, I haven't done any of the file reading, I've just done this. But um, if you press the buttons, you will be able to toggle the textures, etc. So I've already registered those actions for you. Okay, so the actions that I've registered are the quit action, um, the pause action, the follow, uh, toggle follow. Oh yeah, toggle follow is, um, that's toggling the follow camera, so that's the Y key. I've also done toggle textures and toggle, toggle collisions. This, um, this is just incorrect over here, so I'll fix that. So up here, you're going to have to register the actions for all of the game. Um, the game actions such as like moving up, down, left, and right, and attacking. So you have to do that. That's really easy though. In here is where you're going to use uh, the, you're going to read in the level file. So this is very similar to assignment three, how you implemented that. However, um, I want you to use the get position function. So for example, the get position function here, you have to implement, it takes in rx, ry, tx, and ty. So that's the room coordinate and the tile coordinate of something. And it's going to return, um, so implement this function which takes in the room coordinate as well as the tile coordinate and returns the vec2 game world position of the center of the entity. Okay? So that's what you have to do there. Um, next is spawn player. So up here I've spawned the player. You might have to move this inside one of your if statements if you want. But just to give you an example, I've spawned the player at position 640 by 480, and I've given it, what have I given it? An animation, okay? So right now, if I hit the, uh, the C button, it has, it's, it's toggling on and off the bounding box drawing, but it's not there because it doesn't have one. So here, for example, um, if I add component C bounding box, and I'm gonna give that a vec2, uh, 48, 48, and this is going to block movement, and it's going to block vision. Okay, so that's how that works. Now let me run it again. And if I hit the T key to toggle off textures, and I hit the C key to turn on the bounding box um, toggling, then you'll see it's a black bounding box. And black bounding boxes are drawn if it blocks both uh, movement and vision. So if it doesn't block movement, but it does block vision, then what you should see is, I believe, a red bounding box. Yep. And if it blocks vision or movement, but not vision, then you'll see a blue bounding box. Correct. Okay. And it will be white if it blocks neither. All right. So that's how that works. So you have to do this function. So implement the function so that it uses the parameters input from the level file for the player. Those parameters should be stored in the M player config variable. So for example, if I add another component, which is C health, and I say that the player is going to have seven health, then this should work. Now, if I draw this, oh, one second, I'm going to go over to components, see health. Oh, it has a starting health and a current health. So if I give it a, uh, or what is that? Maximum health and current health. So if I say it has a maximum health of seven, but a current health of three, then when I run this, uh, done for you already should be the drawing of the health box. Okay. So that's done for you so that you can more easily debug your, your application. Okie dokie. Moving right along, so that's the spawn player function, and you should read from the m player config variable in order to do that. But that's very similar to assignment three already. 
The next function is the spawn sword function. So the spawn sword function is passed in an entity, and that's the entity who's wielding the sword. And typically this will be the player, right? So you'll be passing in the player entity to this. So implement the spawning of the sword, which should be given an appropriate lifespan, right? So I said it was 10 frames, I believe. Should spawn at the appropriate location based on the player's facing direction. One thing I forgot to show is that the transform Okay, now it has a facing as well. Uh, we actually don't need this angle anymore, so I'll, I'll just leave it there. It doesn't really matter. But now it has facing. Facing is either going to be uh, is going to be a length one vector. So you're uh, right now you're facing uh, zero in the x direction and you're facing one in the y direction. So if you're facing zero in the x and one in the y, it means that you are facing downward. Okay, if you're facing 1 in X and 0 in Y, it means you're facing to the right. That's what facing means. And that's, what you're, that's how you're going to store the direction that he's facing. Um, the sword is going to be given a hard-coded damage value of 1 for this assignment. And it should play the slash sound whenever you um, draw the sword. The update, the function, the update function, uh, you're going to have to implement the pause functionality correctly here. Okay, so similar to assignment 3. The movement function, uh, you're going to do all of the movement logic in here, okay? And that's based on the input component variables. So in the do action function, you should not be doing any of the movement logic, okay? All of the movement logic, logic should be done inside the movement function. Um, and this is true of all entities. So all the movement of all the entities is done there, including like follow behavior, patrol behavior, etc. So, the do action function, uh, this is pretty straightforward. You have to do the actions in here. You did that for assignment three. In the AI function, you have to implement the follow behavior, and you also have to implement the patrol behavior. But when you implement the follow behavior and you implement the patrol behavior in here, what you're doing is you are just setting the velocities of of the entities. And then from in here you set the velocities, but inside the movement system you actually use the velocities to update the position. Okay? So in this in, in this function, you're not directly modifying the position of the NPCs. You are instead um, modifying their velocities and then the movement system will update the position of the NPCs. And if you look over here um, in the level file, all of the NPCs are given the NPC tag. And so in here, uh, in order to do AI, you would loop through like, hey, entity manager, give me everything that has the NPC tag. And then if it has the follow component, oh, I, I, didn't, I didn't look at the AI components yet. Sorry about that. Let me do that now. So there's two new uh, components. One is follow player. Okay, so C follow player. So the follow component has two variables. One is the speed at which the entity should follow the player if it can see it. And the other one is the home position. So the home position is where the entity spawns. So set the home position of the entity within the follow player component. And then if that entity is no longer within vision of the player, then it should um, return to the home position. The patrol component is a little bit um, a little bit more confusing. We have three variables. One is the speed. The second one is a vector of vectors. That is the ordered list of positions. Okay? So if we go back over to our level file, and up here where we have the patrol behavior. So this is position one, this is position two, this is position three, this is position four. Those are given in tile coordinates. So here you have to translate those to real world coordinates and store them inside this vector of patrol positions. Now, the way that this is implemented, if I can go back to this for a second, is as follows. So this is how you're going to implement patrolling. So let's say you have one patrol point here, another one here, um, another one here, and another one here. So let's just say that this is like uh, zero, zero, this is uh, four, zero, this is four, four, 
and this is um, 0, 4. So what you first have to do is translate the tile positions into actual vec2 positions. So 0, 0 will stay 0, 0. 4, 2, well, that's in tile positions, so that will be 256, 0 in game world positions. This will be 256, 256, and this will be 0, 256. Now, once we have those translated, we put those into a vector. Okay, so let me draw the vector down here. So this is my vector. Uh, this has one too many things. One second. Let me draw lines. Okay, so that vector is going to be of length four because there are four positions. Those positions are um, given in the order that we pass them in. So that's going to be zero, zero. Then it's going to be uh, 256, zero. And then 256, 256. And then zero, 256. So if I pass them in in this order, then we should do the follow behavior around in a circle like this. Okay. Now, there's one other um, variable here, which is current position. And what current position is, if I go back here, current position is the current index of the patrol positions that we are heading towards. And so what, what your algorithm for the follow or for the patrol behavior is going to do is it's going to say, okay, I'm going to walk toward at the given speed my the current position. So for example, if the current position is zero, zero, and my entity is out here somewhere, I'm going to calculate the vector from my current position to the patrol position that I'm trying to get to, which is currently zero, zero, and I'm going to scale this vector so that it has the given speed. Now, what I said in the level file was you keep heading in that direction until you get within a radius of five pixels around that position okay once you get to within that radius you consider that you've now reached that point and then you increment the position so now once you've gotten over here somewhere now you're trying to head towards this one and so once you get to that one now you're trying to head toward this one once you get to this one you're trying to head toward that one and once you're at this one you're heading back to this one Okay, so you wrap it around and that way you're going to go through each of them. So that's the patrol behavior. It shouldn't, it's probably one of the trickier things to implement, but it shouldn't be that bad. And so that's what all of these variables are. Okie doke. So that's where you implement this here um, in the AI component. The status, we have a new uh, thing. So before we just had lifespan as sort of a status, but now we have lifespan and we have invincibility. And so what we're going to do here is inside the status system, we're going to do lifespan, and you can just copy that over from assignment three, that's fine. And we're also going to do the invincibility frames here, okay? And so the invincibility frames, uh, again, I already talked about that, but you're going to be looking at this invincibility component, and you're going to be saying, okay, uh, look at the iframes, subtract one of them, and then if the iframes are now at zero, then remove the iframe component. So you don't do the actual collisions here in that system. The collisions are done in the collision system, but whether or not the player actually takes damage is going to be whether or not uh, the player currently has that invincibility component attached to it. Okay, so that's what the status one does, is it just updates the status of the lifespan and updates the status of the invincibility. Next, we have the collision system, and it's very similar to the collision system in assignment three. However, there's just a couple of different cases in this one. So the first thing you have to do is you have to implement the entity tile collisions. And honestly, you can pretty much copy and paste the code that you have from assignment three to do the entity tile collisions in assignment four. Because even though there's no gravity in assignment four, the way that the player bangs into walls is exactly the same. Not only that, but it's also exactly the same for the NPCs. So this is a feature which you can just copy straight from assignment three, as long as it's your own code, right? Not anyone else's code. Uh, then you're going to implement the enemy player collisions with the appropriate damage calculations. So for example, when the player collides with an enemy, you're going to subtract the enemy's damage from the player's health. 
only but you're only going to do that if the player doesn't ha currently have invincibility frames then you're going to do the sword to npc collisions right so you can look up the sword entities you can look up the npc entities and do that there and then if they're colliding then if the sword has a damage component then you're going to subtract the damage component of the sword from the health component of the entity implement the black tile collisions and the teleporting um, so when you do the black tile collisions you're first going to have to detect whether or not your character is on top of a black tile and if it is then you're going to have to look up the positions of all the black tiles in the map and teleport to a random one however what you can do here is please teleport them like underneath another black tile because if you teleport it directly onto another black tile then you'll just be teleporting around the map infinitely fast so make sure you're not tel teleporting directly on top of another black tile it's it should be one tile to the left or right or down or whatever then you're going to implement the entity heart collisions and life gain logic so uh if i go back to the game and run this then the, what, what I mean by that is the heart has a, has a uh, collision component and I'm going to pick up the heart and destroy the heart if uh, something collides with it. And remember that entities can also pick up the heart. Uh, there's something really cool over here that if I walk really fast, you can see that this entity over here actually will steal this heart if I don't get to it fast enough. Okay. So uh, what else? Oh, and you may want to use some helper functions in here. Like, for example, if you want to have a function which is like entity tile collisions, um, you can do that because this is going to be quite a long function, probably where most of the logic is going. Um, so the animation function is going to do several new things that it didn't have to do for assignment three. So, of course, in here, you're going to actually call the update function of each animation. But you're also going to have to do the following. So you're going to have to implement the way that the player is facing. So you're going to have to change the animation based on that. Um, you're going to have to implement the sword animation based on where the player is facing. And remember to update the sword position on every frame. Because, and I got to relaunch this again, the sword follows the player around. So while I'm moving, the sword position is being updated. And not only that, but if I turn while I'm attacking, the sword should follow the turn. Okay? Next, uh, you should also implement the destructions of entities with non-repeating finished animations. So what that means, again, is that, uh, for example, this was more prevalent in Assignment 3, but in Assignment 2, uh, if I kill something and it has an explosion animation, then after the explosion is finished, then the entity is going to be destroyed. Next, you're going to do the camera logic, okay? So basically what this does is here's how you get the current view of the camera. This, so you go to the, the game engine, you get the window, and you get the view. If we should currently be following Link with the camera, so if I go back, so this is the follow mode, what I have to do is center the view onto Link, okay? So if M follow, this is where I'm centering the camera view on top of Link. Else, this is the room-based view, okay? So that's what you have to do there. By default, if I run the program, uh, it might look like I'm doing the room-based view for you, but it's not because room 00 just happens to be like the exact dimensions of the, of the starting screen, but none of this logic is actually done for you. You have to make sure that when you're moving around, you're actually switching the room view. So if I go back again, room view, uh, if I switch to that, when I, when I go into a new room, um, I'm, I'm switching to that room in the camera view. Uh, also, the on end function is not done for you. So look at what I did for assignment three for this. When, when you press the escape key, you should call the on end function. And when you call the on end function, you go back to the menu scene you stop playing the in-game music and you start playing the menu music. Okay, so that's what this does right here. And the rendering is done for you. So you can have a look at that code if you want, but that's all been done for you, so you don't have to do any of that. And that, my friends and colleagues, is assignment four.
It took a long time to explain, but of course there's a lot of intuitive stuff that we explained there that you don't really have to, um, to worry about too much. So that's it. Uh, assignment three is due tonight and good luck on assignment four.